this morning that you all maybe are very familiar with and it's the one that Jesus says right after Peter makes what we call the good confession or the great confession he says I believe Jesus that you are the Christ the son of the living God he makes this great confession as as he's talking to his disciples he asks them what do you believe about me who do people say that I am all these kinds of things and right after it Jesus says this phrase he says and I tell you that you're Peter and on this rock, which Peter means rock, or rocky, it's a kind of a nickname, his name was Simon before. I tell you that on this rock, I will build my church. On this rock, I will build my church. This is the first use of the word church ever in our Bibles. It's the first time that it appears in a conversation. And Jesus is the first one that opens up the idea of what church is in this moment. And I can tell you this that I'm betting everyone in here has an opinion on the church. Everyone in here has an opinion about what church means. We all have ideas and thoughts and processes that have been built up by culture, maybe by our families, maybe by our experiences. In fact, I can remember the first time I invited somebody to church. We're in an invited series, right? That I invited somebody to church to come with me. I was a teenager. I think I was in maybe junior high. I invited somebody to come with me. It was my friend uh, who played on the basketball team with me. He was super popular. Um, he was, the, I think, our leading scorer on the basketball team. And he didn't want to come with me. He said, I, I think of two things when I think of the church. I think that the church is hypocritical. And I think that all the church ever talks about is money. These were his responses to me, and I kept inviting him. He eventually came with me. We came, we sat down in the first couple of rows of the church, and we sat down for the sermon, and the pastor got up there, and he started talking about the building campaign that they were getting ready to do that week. They were getting ready to add on a gym and an education wing to our church. And all of his fears were realized in that moment. You could just see him like sweaty and uncomfortable for the 20, 30 minute sermon that happened. And to make matters worse, he was so uncomfortable when he got out to leave that afternoon. You know, the service was 11. We, we left a little bit later. You know, it was like afternoon. As he gets ready to leave, he goes towards what, like over here, we got a couple of double doors. But at this church, there was a kind of a door on one side. And instead of having a second door, there was just this big glass panel that looked like a door. And he walks right into it, hits his nose, and it becomes bleeding. So not only did he leave hurt emotionally, but he left hurt physically from his first experience of church. My bet is, if I went around the room this morning, you'd all have an opinion of the church, right? You'd all have an opinion. His opinion didn't change much that day. <laughs> Might have gotten worse. But we all have opinions of the church, don't we? What is church about? What is it like? What do I experience when I go? I, my journey with church has been, well, when I was a kid, I thought it was boring. When I got a little bit older. I kind of got excited about it when I gave my life to Jesus. And then at some point in my life, I thought, man, there's good churches and bad churches. And then at some point, I just kind of said, I'm going to love the whole church. But everybody's got a different opinion about what church is, what it means, what it should be. The uh, creator of the Alpha program, maybe you guys know what Alpha is, it's kind of a basic Christian beliefs program that's, that's all around the world. It was created by a guy named Nicky Gumbel out of the United Kingdom. Now, Nicky, before he met Jesus, would have described himself as an angry atheist. That's how he described himself. That's his self-proclaimed description of who he was. In fact, he would say, I was mostly hostile towards Christians. He said, then one day, my roommates in college decided they were going to give their lives to God and start going to church. And this is his quote that he says when he found that out. Oh my gosh, they used to be such lovely people. How can I help them? <laughs> He's like, that was his opinion of the church. Was, why would nice people go to church? I don't get that. <laughs> so Nikki, when he started Alpha, began to go around on the streets and poll people. What do you think about the church? And for the next 45 seconds or so, I want to just say some of the opinions that people have about the church. Let's watch this quick video. Yeah, I go to church nearly every day. 
I normally go to church at Christmas with my family. I used to go to church when I was younger with my mum, but I, just, I used to get bored and not really listen, so... Church, I think it's actually a really good thing to go to. Yeah, I like, I like kind of what it stands for in the sense of the community and kind of what it brings. I don't really like the church. Maybe a bit of old fashion. <laughs> a bit backwards sometimes. I believe that church can teach people good morals. You know, I, I know people go to church religiously and, and then they'll be in a nightclub doing some scandalous things. You know, so does that make them a better person than me? I think it's a beautiful place to be. It's really calm and peaceful and it's lovely when you're there. Central towns, central cities, central villages. If there was a God, I think that you'd be pretty happy for people to just recognise you just and not, you know, necessarily go to church every Sunday or something. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I've got mixed feelings about it. We all have an opinion on the church. I love the honesty of the people that they pull on, on the street corners. I don't like it. Some people thought the, the churches are beautiful. Um, I've got mixed feelings. Do I really need to go? Does some, somebody that lives one way and does something else? We all have opinions about the church. We, we live in, in, in Illinois. Uh, most of us, I think, probably in the room live in Illinois. Um, the land of Lincoln. So what did Abraham Lincoln have to say about the church? If all the people who fell asleep in church were laid out end to end, they'd be a lot more comfortable. <laughs> Some of you, it hasn't hit you what that means yet. Okay. It's funny. That's funny, right? But sometimes our, our feelings of church are filled with pain, regrets, disappointments. We all look at the church through a different lens. Today, I want to explore the church with you. I want to explore what it means to be invited to the church, what it means to be invited to this thing that Jesus first started talking about in Matthew 16. On this rock of the good confession, I will build my church. Corey opened up this series of invited last week by talking about everyone is invited to faith. Everyone is invited to faith. It doesn't matter your background, your pedigree, your personality, where you come from, where you're going, your past sins, your past failures. It doesn't matter. Everyone is invited to faith. Today, we're exploring that not only is everyone invited to faith, but everyone is invited to the church. Everybody is invited to church. Everyone is invited to participate in this thing. It doesn't matter if you're skeptical. It doesn't even matter if you're hostile towards the church. You're still invited to the church. You're still invited to the church. No one in the history of mankind has ever been struck by lightning by walking into the church. It's the number one excuse that I hear as a pastor. Oh, I can never come to your church. I'll be struck by lightning. <laughs> Some of you are laughing because you've heard it too And you've felt it in your spirit I have people in our family That have told me this I can't visit your church, I will get killed Like that's the feeling of church And that's the problem, isn't it? That's the problem with the church The problem is that The church hasn't always done a very good job Of making people feel well the church hasn't always done a very good job of saying, it's okay if you don't believe, you can still be here. The church hasn't always done a great job of saying, you know what? Even if you don't want to come to the weekly meeting, you're still invited to the church. Every person, that's why we've been using this illustration this month, every person's invited to the table. Every person's invited to the table that is the church, that is God's family. So what did Jesus mean? Let's put that Matthew 16 passage up there one more time. What did Jesus mean by this? On the rock of the statement, you're the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. I'm going to build my church. What did Jesus mean? Because he introduced the idea, no one else did, of the church. Did he mean this? A nice little white country church building? Potlucks. Everybody knows their names. Maybe you've experienced a church like that. Did he mean this? High church. The same thing happens every week. You know when to stand up. You know when to sit down. You know when to participate in this. You know when you don't participate in that. You know because it's comfortable. It's easy. It's religion. It's simple. Did he mean that? Did he mean this? A good band. What we call a spectator church. You can go. Oh, listen, man, the music was good. The pastor told a funny story and you go home and you didn't engage at all. Did he mean this? Are we the church? 
You know, none of the last four pictures I showed you existed in 30 AD when Jesus made that statement, on the rock, I will build my church. So none of those must be the answer. Webster will know. Let's look at Webster. They know all right. A public building, especially for Christian worship. The clergy or officialdom of the religious body, the persons that are ordained for the ministry. Is that what Jesus meant? A public building, the clergy, the pastors, the worship band. What did Jesus mean? The original word is the word ecclesia. And it was never used as a religious word. It was never a religious word. It was not used by the Apostles. It was not used by the prophets. It was not used by the temple people. It was not used by the priests or the religious leaders. It was a Greek word. It was a word used by Greek society for, you know, the closest thing we can get to is a school assembly. The closest thing we can get to is a school assembly. <coughs> but he threw this, this ek thing on there, which is like, for those of you that love language, it's this thing that means called out of. This is what the word church means. It's a group of people called into the public arena for a discussion on faith. That's what church means. That's what the original word means. That's what Jesus meant. A group of people called into the public arena for a discussion on faith. It wasn't a club. It wasn't just for those who believe. He wasn't trying to create another temple. In fact, the, the apostles uh, used temple in a lot of ways in the New Testament. They never use it in synonymous with church. What was Jesus trying to do? Jesus was trying to redefine the discussion on faith. He was trying to redefine what people believed about God. He was trying to redefine what people believed about the gathering of people to talk about faith. All people had known up to this point was we go to a building and have a conversation. We go here and do certain religious exercises. We go there so that the pastors and the priests can have a relationship with God and we can keep him at a distance. And he was moving it from that. And he was redefining everything in the discussion on the faith. He was saying now it's all everybody, every person, every walk of life, whatever background, whatever pedigree, whatever personality, come to the table and let's have a different conversation about what faith really looks like. That's what he meant when he said, I'm going to build my church on that. Guys, an invitation to church is an invitation to the discussion on our faith in Jesus. An invitation to church is an invitation to a discussion on our faith in Jesus. And here's what happens. When you begin to discover that the church isn't a building, you begin to like them a little bit more. When you begin to discover that the church isn't the clergy, you begin to go, man, it's really not that bad. When you begin to discover that the church isn't the music, the programs, the kids' ministry, the youth ministry, but the church is something different, you can actually fall in love with the church. Yes. For the rest of this talk, I want to talk to you about some of the things that helped me fall in love with the church. Some of the things that shifted my thinking from it's this group of people that's kind of boring and weird to I actually like the church. Here's the first thing. In this new conversation on faith, you can have a relationship with God. You can actually have a relationship with God. And up to this point, when Jesus introduces the church, you couldn't have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And he's saying, no, you can actually have a relationship with the God of the universe who loves you, who cares about you. He's Messiah, he's Lord, he's Savior, and he so cares about you and so wants to be involved in your life. You can actually come to him and have friendship with him. Paul says it this way in the book of Ephesians. He says, before he made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That's what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. It gave him great pleasure to choose us, to love us, to want to be near us, to want to be around us. To, he doesn't just have to love us, but he actually likes his kids. He actually likes us. And the discussion on faith moves from this religious idea to you can have friendship with God. You can have friendship with God. And so the disciples begin to talk about those things. When they begin to have this conversation, they begin to talk about God's heaven, God's kingdom, God's healing, God's wholeness, all the things that we preached on in our last series. They begin to talk about those things because they're like, you guys are now invited into this amazing relationship with God. A God who chose you before you were ever choosing him. And really, that's the invitation of the church that's so beautiful. 
that even if you're sitting here in this room right now and you have not yet chosen to follow God, he's already chosen you. And that's the discussion that you're now invited into when you're invited to church. That he has chosen you and cares about you and wants to be near you. In this new conversation, you can have a relationship with God. But not only that, in this new conversation, we can have a relationship with his family and actually become a part of God's family. Can you imagine if we changed our idea from this kind of a gathering to the church is a conversation with my family? Now, some of you are going, I don't want to talk to my family. <laughs> but here's the thing about our family, right? We love our family in spite of all of its problems, don't we? We're blood. We love them. We love our family. And what you're invited to, whether your family experience is good or bad, you're invited to a table where you can sit down at the table and have a conversation about Jesus. That's the invitation to church. Listen to what Paul says a little bit further in Ephesians. He says, no, you Gentiles, you're no longer strangers and foreigners. <coughs> you're citizens, along with God's holy people. You're members of God's family. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, guys, I don't care where you came from or where you're going. One passage, he says, I don't care if you're barbarian or not. I don't care if you're a woman, a man, a Jew, a Greek. It doesn't matter. You're all invited to the table. Everybody's invited to sit down at the family gathering. And let's talk about Jesus. That's the invitation to church. And it's a weird conversation when you begin to think about it. It's like everything I thought that God was like, I now have this conversation where not only am I welcomed by God, but I'm welcomed by his kids as well. And nothing matters that I've ever been through. It doesn't matter my background, my sins, my failures, my class, my personality, who I talked to yesterday, what job I have, if I have a job. It doesn't matter. I'm welcome. I'm welcome into God's family. Here's the thing. Um, I don't know if we've always done a good job of expressing that. When I say we, I mean the church universal. I don't know if we've always done a great job of expressing that. That everybody's welcome at the table for the conversation. Everybody's welcome to church. You're welcome to the conversation. I just want to apologize right now for the entire church. If you ever felt like that invitation was not there for you, I apologize for the church. That we've done a bad job of that from time to time. Of welcoming everybody to the table. But the truth is, Jesus, the guy that founded the church, he says, I no longer call you strangers but friends. I no longer call you foreigners and aliens, but family. And how important is that? To know that you're in the family. That you are welcome at the table. My friend, Happy Layman, he and I founded the Urbana Church 40 plus years ago. Happy says it this way. He says, if you don't find six friends in six months, you probably won't hang around in the church very long. Because friendship's so important. Right now, you're hearing from me. If you don't have friends, who are you going to talk to about this thing called Jesus? Who are you going to talk to about his church? Who are you going to talk to about your faith, about God's family? You need to have friends to have the conversation with. Because the church is a big conversation. The church is this amazing conversation. It's this amazing conversation that you're not just saying one time, I want to join the church. You're actually saying, this is a conversation I think is so worthy of my time and attention. I'm going to have this conversation for the rest of my life. And when you begin to have this conversation, you begin to realize that you're a part of a really, really big family. You're part of a really big worldwide family. That you're not just joining a local body of believers here in Bloomington Normal or wherever you live. But you're actually joining a conversation that is impacting our world like crazy. Did you know the church is an amazingly fast-growing organization? Did you know that? It's an amazingly fast-growing conversation. Most people have this in their mind, you can call it fake news or whatever you want to call it, that the church is dying in our world. That's actually not true at all. It's not even close. Let me give you some stats about what has happened in the church recently. Hold on a second. Let me read this scripture first. Ephesians 4. There is one body, one spirit. This is your call into one hope belonging to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all, in all, and through all. We have one big family. And let me tell you about the family that you're a part of. Here it is. Since 1970, 
which is a lot further ago than we think it is. It's like 50 years ago. Since 1970, over 1 billion people have come to faith in our world. In 50 years. One church in South America averages 45,000 people on Sundays in their attendance and has 10 million online watchers. One church. In Africa, in 1900, there were only 10 million believers in Africa. In the year 2000, 100 years later, there was 360 million followers in Africa. That's 360% growth, people. That's pretty good. In China, in 1940, just you know, 40 years later, there are only 4 million believers in China. By 2015, and it's growing still, there are over 100 million believers in China. It's the fastest growing church in the world. One church in South Korea has over 100,000 people in small groups. We're happy if we get like 100 people in small groups. 100,000 people in small groups. Life Church that started in Oklahoma has over 100,000 People in weekly attendance in almost 40 multi-sites. Guys, you are part of the largest conversation on faith the world has ever seen. You're part of a big worldwide church family that is growing by leaps and bounds in our world right now. It's an amazing conversation to be a part of. And the reason I think it grows so quickly and so fast is because ultimately this conversation is about God's love. It's not about more religion. Ultimately, this conversation of faith is about God's love and how much he loves you, how much he cares about you, how much he wants a big family, how much he wants you to love one another, how much you, he wants, to, wants you to love people who are not yet in the family. I love one quote from a church planning coach years ago. It says, the church is an amazing organization. It's the only organization that exists for the people who are not yet in it. I love that idea. We exist to love the people who are not yet in our family. Guys, the church has been known for a lot of atrocious things throughout history. We've been known for the Crusades, or what do we do? We went in Jerusalem and murdered Muslims. We're known for burning women at the stake in the Middle Ages. We've been known for hostility and hatred and bigotry for years and years and years. But the church should never be famous for those things. The church should be famous for its love. The church should be famous for nothing but its love. It's love for Jesus. It's love for each other. It's love for our world. One pastor in Europe was trying to, to grab hold of this idea of what does it mean for the church to be famous for his love. And he says this, the church is Jesus to our world. We spend time feeding and caring for the poor in our cities. We work to nullify sex trafficking in our country. Over half of the preschool and parenting groups are run by the church in my country. We're the largest group of debt cancelers in our world. We fed over 100,000 people in my country alone last year. We're often first responders when there's tragedy or natural disaster when they strike. Our buildings become havens and homes for broken in our communities, not to mention the comfort and hope that we give during funerals and other things. The church should be famous for its love. And as the church becomes famous for its love, the church will still grow and continue to grow as we invite more and more people into this conversation on faith in Jesus. Ephesians 5 says, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. It's a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to its God. The church is a unique conversation, isn't it? The church is a unique conversation. It's about Jesus. It's about God's family. It's about loving the world around us and growing God's family into this amazing thing that it is. When you discover the church isn't the building, the clergy, the worship band, the youth group, you can actually fall in love with the church. You can actually fall in love with the bride of Christ when you discover it's so much more than what you think it is. It's so ingrained in who we are that even in our staff meeting on Wednesday, we struggle a little bit, right, to break down some of the barriers of what we think the church is. It's so ingrained in us that this is a certain thing, a certain picture that we have rather than a welcoming conversation at the table with God. Have you ever had a friend <laughs> that started dating somebody or maybe they even got married to somebody and you loved your friend but you weren't quite so sure about their spouse? You guys ever had that? You ever had that? You're like, man, he's such a cool guy. I love him. But man, his, his new wife, I just don't know. Oh man, she's just one of my best friends. I love to tell her everything, but her husband, I just don't know. You guys ever have that in a relationship, in a friendship? 
And after a while, you, you go, you know what? If I want to remain friends with that guy, that person, I've really got to love their spouse too. Guys, the church is the bride of Christ. The church is Jesus' spouse. And despite all of her failures, all of her mess-ups, all of the things that she's done wrong, Jesus has what I call marriage goggles on for her. He loves his church. Listen to what Paul says even further down in Ephesians. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. What did he do? He gave himself up for her that he might sanctify, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any other such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. Despite all her hurts, her hang-ups, her flaws, Jesus looks at the church with marriage goggles, with love goggles. She's white. She's clean. She's beautiful. If we're going to love like Jesus loved, we better love the things he, he loves the most, right? He loves his church. He loves his church. He loves the conversation that's happening all across our world. Over there in the church that meets across our parking lot that they speak only French, he loves that church. The church that meets across the town that you don't like very much, he loves it. Jesus is in love with his church. He loves this conversation that's happening. He loves how we love our communities. He loves how we're spreading his gospel around the world. He loves how we care for the poor. He loves how we bring healing and wholeness. He loves his church. Some of you today might just need to fall in love with the church again. Some might be sitting in this room and go, I really need to fall back in love with the church again. Realize that Jesus is the center of our conversation. We may not get over who's right, but Jesus is always the center of our conversation. Realize that it's about family. It's about a relationship. It's not about, it's not about religion. It's not about rules and regulations. It's about having a conversation about the one who started the church. It's about God's love being extended across our world. Some of us just need to fall in love with the bride this morning. For others of you, I think the need's probably different. You may just, you need to realize you're loved. You need to realize how much Jesus cares about you. You need to realize how much he cares about you being a part of his family. You need to realize how much he gave up to make you famous. <laughs> Man. The cross of Jesus Christ was a smashing success. It was beautiful. It was awesome. It was amazing. And he said yes to you before you ever even thought about it. You need to realize how much he loves you. We'd love to have you be a part of the family. Love to have you be a part of this worldwide conversation. I think for people in both groups, whether you're falling in love with the church again or for the first time, or you're falling in love with Jesus for the first time, I think either group could maybe enter into an idea of why do we baptize people? I just want to talk about it real quick, about baptism real quick. We've got a baptism plan for second service today, and we, we, some of you might want to jump in, literally. <laughs> because... The way to join the church is pretty simple. It's pretty simple to join a church. You go, Jesus, I believe in you. It starts with faith. We enter into the church through faith. We say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. I believe that he died and rose three days later and conquered sin and death and that he wanted me. He cared about me. It was an amazing sacrifice. It's the Easter story. We enter into the church through faith. We enter into it through belief and trust in him alone. It's not by anything we have to do. It's by what we believe, by what we trust. We enter into the church through faith. And, then, and we give God our faith. And in the moment of us giving him our faith, God gives us something back. He gives us his spirit. He gives us his power, his presence into our lives and says, I'm going to help you with this thing. I'm going to empower you to love people like you've never loved them before. I'm going to empower you to bring healing and wholeness to the world around you. I'm going to fill you with my presence every single day. And I've got so much to give you, you can always ask for it and I'll give you more. Right. I'll give you all of myself. I think sometimes we forget that the church has something to give us too. The church has something to give us too. The church gives us baptism. The 
The church gives us baptism. You can't baptize yourself. You can try. It's kind of weird. But, uh, anyway. Uh, the church gives you baptism. You give God your faith. God gives you his presence, his power, his spirit in your lives. And the church says, this is awesome. You want to be born into a new family? Come get baptized. We give you that gift. You go under the water, you die in your old life, you come out of the water, you say, yes, I'm brand new. I'm in the conversation. I'm going to have it for the rest of my life. That's baptism. Yeah. Some of you need to let the church baptize you today. You need to let the church give you their gift of new birth. This looks differently than you ever thought it would. And I know there's tons of excuses about why not to get baptized today. You're like, I got brunch plans and service going a little long, whatever. I have got a trip I've got to take. I've got to go to work. I don't have a dry shirt. I don't have a towel. I even got those things for it. Don't worry. Some of you need to get baptized today. For the first time, some of you need to get baptized today because you have been in a relationship with Jesus, but you haven't been in a relationship with his church. And you need to get baptized because you need to have a relationship with his bride too. So I encourage you to take a leap of faith. Let's stand this morning. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Invite the worship team back up here. And we're going to sing. If you want to get baptized this service or next service, it actually doesn't matter. I'm going to be kind of standing over in this corner. And I've got a couple other people on staff on the front row here. We'd love to talk to you about baptism. We'd love to talk to you about baptism. Love to encourage you that it's a great thing. It's an amazing thing. It's a powerful thing. It is the gift that the church gives you in this faith journey. Let's pray.